the following is a quote from the Kano Upanishad, from my favorite translation of the Upanishads by Juan Mascaro. Um, who sends the mind to wander far? Who first drives life to start on its journey? Who impels us to utter these words? Who is the spirit behind the eye and the ear? It is the ear of the ear, the eye of the eye, and the word of words. The mind of mind, and the life of life. Those who follow wisdom pass beyond and, on leaving this world, become immortal. There the eye goes not, nor words, nor mind. We know not, we cannot understand, how he can be explained. He is above the known, and he is above the unknown. Thus have we learned from the ancient sages who explained this truth to us. Hmm. Now, in my opinion, and it's not just my opinion, in fact in other people's opinions whom I have more or less adopted, uh, the Kano Upanishad is an attempt to talk about qualia, direct experience of things. Um, it's not so much explaining the scientific processes which result in sight, sound, taste, whatever, even knowledge. It's what it means to experience these things, the direct experience of sight, the direct experience of knowing something. Um, it's a different kind of explanation. It's uh, I can say that this person I've taught this person what 2 and 2 equals 4, so I can ask them, what does 2 and 2 equal? They say, 4. And then I come at them in with several examples. So I'm dealing with a child here. Uh, I give them uh, 2 pebbles and then 2 more pebbles, and I ask them to explain what all this means. And uh, they show me that 1, 2, 3, and then they show me 2 groups of 2, and then... They say they count them 1, 2, 3, 4, and that's why 1 and 2 plus 3 and 4, or 1 and 2 plus 1 and 2 give me 4. I can, I think that I, I can sort of extrapolate from that, that they understand the basic concept of 2 plus 2 equals 4. What does the experience of that possibly new knowledge uh, mean to this child? What, in addition to just knowing the basics of 2 plus 2 equals 4, what does this do to the child's worldview? What does this new knowledge uh, trigger off inside their mind? We, uh, I'll never know that. Um, and in a certain sense, my teaching the child what 2 and 2 equals is not even designed to... I'm not even attempting to find out what they want or from that knowledge or what it means to them or how it fundamentally affects them. I'm just teaching them their numbers. Um, that's a bias, so I can say that all I'm doing is saying 2 plus 2 equals 4 here, but the ripple effects inside that child's mind are going to go far beyond, or maybe they won't go far beyond, but there's a good chance that they'll go far beyond the 2 plus 2 bit. How do we dis describe things like that? What that piece of knowledge, the experience of that piece of knowledge is to that child? Um, I don't know that we have the tools to do it, uh, at least conventionally. I don't think that we can actually discuss that. Um, and if you've ever attempted to discuss abstractions like this with the child. I have, actually, with my nephew. Um, they, You get the impression that they, their mind is working on it, but they don't know what to say to you. Um, an adult is more likely to say, what the hell are you talking about? But a child will sort of say, uh, I don't know. Um, hmm. Uh, 
they'll try to honestly come up with the lexicon to discuss these things, but the lexicon isn't really there in our language, in the language that we've already taught them before we start teaching them things like 2 plus 2 equals 4. It's a system limitation. Um, ask them to describe what red is. Ask them to describe what sweet tastes like. Ask them to describe what uh, hunger feels like. Uh, they, you know, uh, an adult is likely to sort of say, well, that's impossible, or that's a stupid question, or whatever. Otherwise, uh, just bat the question away and say, that's an invalid question. A child will attempt, or occasionally, or you know, my experience with children is they will attempt to answer that question. But they, they'll they sort of run up against uh, the, the limitations in the language and sort of say, well, sorry, I <laughs> can't help you. Um, I don't have any way of communicating that with you. Uh, which leads me to the sort of point of why is it that we have to rely on stuff like this, which people call holy books, to describe things like experience? Well, we don't really have to. Um, if you've ever heard a bunch of teenage girls talking about their various various experiences, um, once I went out, me and my wife went out for bubble tea, and uh, we sat there, and I was listening to the to a, a gaggle of teenage girls talking about things in that kind of uh, lingo that changes from generation to generation, but it stays essentially the same. Um, I'm like, no way, and she's like, afraid so, and I'm like, oh my god, and all this kind of thing. Well, you sit there for half an hour of this, and you sort of, how do they sustain this? You're first inclined to just sort of say, what a pile of crap. My god, teenagers are so shallow, especially, I hate to say this, this is a sexist thing to say, but especially teenage girls, they'll talk for hours about things that are utterly irrelevant. Well, I would just say that those teenage girls are attempting to describe their experiences. They're attempting to essentially do the same thing as is attempted here in the Kena Upanishad. They're trying to explain what it felt like, what it meant to have the qualia that they experienced in whatever situations they're attempting to discuss. Um, and... <laughs> Because they're not exactly poetically inclined, and they use uh, adolescent jargon, it sounds like just crap uh, to somebody like me. It sounds like just junk to be dismissed and just teenage babbling of, uh, of banalities and stupidities that just teenagers do for whatever reason. I don't understand it. I don't think that to them it means that. I think that they're attempting to get across to each other uh, what their experiences are, what their qualia are. Uh, it, they're, they're speaking in a code that I don't understand and that I have a pre-existing prejudice against. I can't stand, in the normal course of things, hear people prattle endlessly using adolescent jargon. Well, actually, I can more than a lot of people can, but it does seem like uh, really, really pointless, um, endless, repetitive junk that they're talking. But you can't talk about experience, qualia, using conventional language. You read, say, an existentialist like Sartre, who actually does attempt to discuss experience using uh, clinical scientific language. He does get poetic, but um, he generally attempts at least to stay clinical and detached. And you get, you start reading something like Being in Nothingness, you get five pages into it, and it's just your, you know, the proverbial trying to run when you're up to your knees in thick mud. It's, man, this is hard going. Uh, and, you, and you're not really enjoying it either. You're sort of, why should I, why am I even doing this? You second guess yourself. Why the hell should I discuss this? Or study this? It, it's boring, it's dry, it's meaningless. Well, I can see why Southwell would have taken that kind of 
um, approach to discussing the things that he was discussing because Nietzsche had attempted uh, to say, I am an atheist, I don't believe in God, in fact I heap scorn on the idea of God, but he still used poetic, um, aphoristic phraseology, he used parables, he spoke parabolically about things that are almost impossible to discuss clinically. Um, and uh, he injected a lot of feeling into what he wrote, and his work with not a huge amount of editing was used as one of the um, intellectual underpinnings of Nazism. And he predicted this, apparently, that somebody was going to do this, and maybe I shouldn't even have written this because it's so easily abused. Well, you pick this up and you get the same feeling. This stuff can be abused. Um, religion, religious phraseology, is dangerous. It's far more volatile than people realize. And a certain degree of detachment and um, knee-jerk dismissiveness, per perhaps, has developed in what we would call, I guess, the, um, the scholarly mind against this kind of thing. They sort of say, you're bringing emotions into the mix here to attempt to describe things um, which um, are volatile. Emotions are notoriously inexact, and poetic language can so easily be misconstrued that just by using this kind of language, you're playing with explosives. You're not just playing with fire, you're playing with nuclear uh, fission here. You, you, what, when you start talking like an Old Testament prophet uh, about anything, really, even if you're just talking about things that are... Um, that are fairly dry, like, as I say, the Kena Upanishad, I think that that's actually kind of dry, even though they're using enormously poetic language to discuss the same thing that Sartre was talking about. Um, you're getting into territory that is dangerous because you're hitting people in when you're communicating that way. You're hitting them in the subconscious. You're hitting them in the id. Um, you're hitting them uh, in the reptilian brain. You're hitting them in the irrational side of their character which may be necessary, but it's notoriously unpredictable. Um, and I'm not going to say that I thoroughly disapprove of this sort of atheistic or scientific sort of conviction or scientific uh, conviction, scholarly conviction, that poetic and flowerly phraseology is something along the lines of haram at, a, uh, at times, forbidden just because it is what it is. Um, I understand the, the fear that people have when they say, okay, even if we do accept, say, things like the Bible, metaphorically, um, just the way that it's put together affects people on the irrational level and thus on a completely unpredictable level and we still can't do that. We have to be careful. So Sartre, who had just lived through the Second World War and seen the experience of uh, Nazism and uh, the Third Reich and, and uh, the Holocaust and all this stuff, had seen how Nietzsche's work or other philosophy, philosophies or philosophers of that type can so easily be deliberately railroaded, and I guess he just decided. And and not only that, he's he's French, and the French normally approach these things fairly clinically in in a, in a detached manner. Uh, so he just took the clinical and detached manner when he um, put forth all of his ideas. Although not always, he wrote a lot of he wrote novels and everything where there were you know subconscious subliminal messages, and Camus actually wrote some pretty emotional or emotive stuff. Nothing on, nothing to the extent of Nietzsche. Um, so, I understand the, the, the knee-jerk and sort of um, instant sort of dismissal of anything that's written in metaphor and poetry, and I think that it's, the, the thinking behind it isn't completely narrow-minded. Um, the thinking behind the idea that, okay, you have to stay away from 
um, anything that smacks of religion uh, because of where it can go is not completely misguided. Um, it's good to sort of um, keep the self-discipline. I, I, I keep coming back to this self-discipline thing. It's good to have self-discipline when you're in your speculations because things, your, your experiments, your your speculations, your um, your thinking can go to places where you didn't intend or understand where it might go, um, and it could have consequences that you're not prepared for. As I say, you can you can end up having an existential crisis, uh, throwing yourself into a state of existential panic through simply sitting down and meditating. I've done that. It's uh, you sort of think, what the hell, what's impo what's so dangerous about sitting down in the uh, in the lotus position and just you know maybe uh, put on some new age music or something like that? What's you know that certainly can't lead to nasty results. Oh yes, it can um, because again your mind goes into recess or your your conscious mind goes into recesses of your your uh, subconscious or non-conscious mind or whatever that you are unfamiliar with or at least that your conscious mind is not familiar with and bang oh my god look what was there now if you're only gonna do that to yourself and you can only imagine what the effect of getting up and talking polemically uh, is going to have on a crowd of people with their own preconceptions in their mind especially when uh, the preconceptions are hurt pride um, fear, anger, that kind of thing. Um, you can imagine where you're going to lead these people. Um, so I think that, um, again, it's not completely misguided to automatically sort of distrust what comes out of things like this. Uh, I don't think that it's, it's necessarily a species of bigotry to sort of automatically um, want, at least, or to dismiss things like holy books. Um, it's kind of a healthy response to at least be on your guard when you're approaching uh, ideas through poetry and metaphor. Um, although the unfortunate fact is I don't see how we can approach certain things otherwise. How do we discuss Qualia. We can't use the current lexicon to do that, or at least the current philosophical lexicon to do that. We need to find, perhaps, a more efficient version of the jargon that those teenagers were using when they were discussing their feelings with each other uh, in that little Chinese cafe where we were sipping our bubble tea. Um, they were on to something. Uh, they were discussing their own experiences and they were trying to do it in the best way that they had at their disposal. They're teenagers. They don't have um, the tools yet. Um, or maybe they do have tools but they want to make sure that everyone else understands their tools. So they have in-group uh, communication methods. It just sounds crazy and nauseating, I suppose, uh, when you're not part of that in-group. Um, and this only sounds like religious fanaticism if you're not um, tuned in to the same sort of discourse as is being used by other people who are pointing to the same thing. Um, Qualia, I think, are massively underestimated, uh, at least in a lot of quarters, especially among people of a scientific bent. Uh, the, the scientific way of thinking seems to indicate that if we can't discuss it, then let's just not deal with it. Well, okay, maybe for the purposes that science has set out for itself. Yes, I can understand that. Um, but that doesn't mean that these things are not fundamental to everything, especially fundamental to everything that we are.